Hey everybody, welcome back to the Living Faith Fellowship Discipleship Conference virtually. Uh, hopefully if you're watching this, you've already watched session one, but this is session two. I personally, hopefully this is the first time you've heard it, but for me, I feel like Bill Murray and Groundhog's Day because of camera issues and audio issues. Uh, this is like the second or third time I've preached this. And so I feel like Bill Murray just going through it over and over again. However, I hope this time is going to work out great for every one of us. Uh, and therefore, hopefully you've already watched session one. If you have not, I would encourage you to stop here, go back, watch session one, and then pick up here in session two. Session two is going to take us from our overall thought process of the book of Proverbs of laying out the paradigm uh, into a more focused uh, area in which we are going to expose discipleship through the book of Proverbs. So what we're going to do is do a quick review and then we will dive into this. Obviously, if you're listening to this, you know all about why we're doing this online and, and because of the COVID, the conf, uh, conference got canceled itself. Uh, so we're doing this online. And so I, hopefully this is being a blessing to each and every one of you. And I hope you're encouraged from the word of God that is being taught so that we will ultimately make disciples. That's why we were left on this earth to do so. So what I'm going to do to start out in session two is we're going to do a quick review uh, just so that I, who knows maybe you're like me I, I listen to podcasts and YouTube videos pretty much all the time and sometimes I'll listen to a series and it may take me a, a few days to get back to the second part or third part and so a quick review will help each and every one of us and so if you will look here in discipleship uh, number two uh, what we're going to do session two I'm sorry uh, we're going to do a quick review remember Psalms 19 7 it says the law of the Lord is perfect Perfect. Converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. Making wise the simple. Okay. And we said this is the verse that launches us into the book of Proverbs. Uh, it is the verse that is showing us exactly what we need to do. We need to take the law of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord, and our job is to make wise the simple. Okay. And so we get into the new uh, or into the book of Proverbs, and we said that there are five characters woven all the way throughout the book of Proverbs and the book of Proverbs is a book of discipleship. It is not one line Twitter bombs. This is not a thought bomb here and a thought bomb there. This is an actual thread of thought that goes from chapter one all the way to the end. And the five main characters of the book are the simple one, the prudent man, the scorner, the fool, and the wise man. And we said 172 verses deal directly with this paradigm. So if you think, ah, you know, I don't know if you, you know, if I can really see that in the book. Let, let me tell you, 172 direct references uh, to these folks. And every time, well, I won't say every time, but the vast majority of time that you see a verse on the simple one, you'll either see a fool or a scorner or a prudent man along with it. Uh, and because God does a lot of contrasting through this. And we said that the word is simple, uh, that God uses there is not unlearned, ignorant, or even some would even refer to retarded. That is not how God uses that word. That word is a word that is to kind of be a picture word, and it's like a blank sheet of paper. And it literally means that nothing has been written on that blank sheet of paper yet. It's not that the person is unintelligent. He just hasn't learned anything yet. And so we said, instead of using blank sheets of paper, uh, we use t-shirts. Normally when I'm doing this live and had I done this live in March, what we would have done is we would ask people out of the crowd to come up, put on a t-shirt and on that t-shirt would have been written the characteristics of each uh, person. The simple one has nothing written on its shirt. And so what we're doing is we need that simple man, according to Psalms 19, seven to be led into the land of wisdom. This guy down over here. However, we know left to himself, 
That's not where he's going to end up. What he needs is somebody to come alongside of him, somebody who is a guide or a discipler, somebody who's going to take him by the hand and lead him into the land of wisdom. And that's who the prudent man is. He's the discipler. He's the guy that's supposed to come alongside and say, hey, follow me. Let me show you some things. Let me teach you some things. And the bottom line is if the prudent man says, you know what? I don't want to do this. This is kind of not my thing. I just want to go to church. I just don't want to really spend a lot of time investing in somebody else's life. Then the scorner comes along and he says, hey, I'll do it. I'll be more than glad to disciple the simple one. I'll be more than glad to lead him into the land of fools. And that's why it's so important that you and I take discipleship, not as a quote unquote, another ministry of the church. It is the ministry of the church. It is what we do. It's we take the simple and lead them into the land of wisdom. Because if we don't, the scorner is going to lead them into a land of fools. So we said the simple, he's a blank sheet of paper, right? He vo he's void of understanding. He's gullible. He lacks insight. He's easily deceived. That's why it's important that he has a guide. Now, the prudent man, he conceals knowledge, regards reproof. His shirt's been written on, right? And so his characteristics is he looks after the simple. He's a discipler. He conceals knowledge, foresees evil, covers shame, regards reproof he gets knowledge so he, so once you get knowledge you want to continue to get it right okay we'll come back to that the scorner his shirt's been written on also he won't listen he hates reproving proud haughty delights in disobedience can't gain wisdom scoffer and a mocker okay now, the fool, let's talk about the fool. Uh, the fool has uh, his shirt written on. He says that there is no God, right? Uh, that's actually out of the book of Psalms, but he, he says there is no God. He mocks sin. He slanders. He hides hatred. His father is a shame. He's contentious. No delight in understanding. Then we have the wise man, which is our goal. This is where we're trying to get to, right? He shall inherit glory, and that's not talking about heaven, loves rebuke, makes a glad father, refrains his lips, he wins souls, he listens to counsel, and he departs from evil. Okay, so now that we've laid these guys out, let's pick up today with our new series, our session number two, now that we've gotten the whole uh, review out of the way. Now let's talk about, number one, the biblical goals of discipleship. Now that we We've seen the overall paradigm or the overall view of what discipleship is in the book of Proverbs. Then now we're going to see that the book of Proverbs has three specific goals. Now, in saying this, I want everybody here to be careful not to confuse what I'm saying with the four goals of discipleship we teach in our church about establishing uh, your discipler in the word and establish them in worship and then establish them in the church and establish them in ministry. We get all those four goals. We, the, I, I'm not against that, but what I'm saying is we're specifically talking about the book of Proverbs. And so God lays out the paradigm of the overall view of discipleship through those five characters, but God doesn't leave us stranded. He gives us three specific goals that we're supposed to be doing within that paradigm of discipleship. Okay. And so Let's set the context, okay? Last week we talked about this, and, and we said that Proverbs uh, chapter 1, you get through the first five verses, and Solomon tells you why he actually wrote the book of Proverbs. And he says, listen, I wrote it, you know, so that you could know wisdom and instructions that you can perceive the words of understanding. Look at these words he's using now. Pay attention. To receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. Now watch this. To give subtlety to the simple. Okay? And we said that word subtlety is translated other places in your Bible as one, prudence. It's where we get our word the prudent man, okay? It's also translated wise or wisdom, okay? So why, why did he write it? To give prudence 
and wisdom to who? The simple. So he's telling you there's some steps. I want you to take the simple man from being simple into the land of wisdom. But before you do that, you're going to have to bring him into the land of prudence. And we're, we're going to talk about that, the uh, prudent man. Now, we go on. This is the same chapter down in verse 20. Wisdom crieth out, she uttereth her voice in the street. She crieth in the chief places of the concourse, in the opening of the gates. In the city she uttereth her voice, saying, How long, how long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity, and the scorner delight in scorning, and fools hate knowledge? Now listen, we're not even out of chapter 1. And God's already telling us, hey, I wrote the book so you could get the simple guy into the land of wisdom. But before he even gets out of the chapter, he starts laying out some contrasts. Man, wisdom's crying out. Hey, simple one, how long are you going to lay there? How long are you going to just go through life without wisdom? And then he goes on and he says, yeah, you scorner guys. I see you there. And he says, listen, you delight in scorning. Fools, you hate knowledge. And so he's already setting the stage here in verse 20. Now, uh, verse 27 comes along after 20 through 26 that we just read. He says, when your fear come as desolation and your destruction come as a whirlwind, you, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For they that hated knowledge, there he is, did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despise my reproof therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices for the turning away of the simple shall slay them all right in other words if you and i don't if we turn them away Let's don't do discipleship. Let's focus on a different type of ministry. Well, we just don't really do that discipleship thing at my church. Well, I'm just telling you, if you do, it's a death sentence for those that are in your church that are of the simple. Okay? Now, that's verses 27 through 33. Now, the chapter ends. Chapter 2 begins. Now... The reason why I'm setting the context in chapter 1 before I even get to chapter 2 is sometimes we think, well, the chapter changed, therefore the context changed. That's not necessary. Uh, in some cases it is, but not in this one. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1 and through 6. He says, my son. Now, I want you to pay attention to the term, my son. We will come back to that. I believe it's 23 times in the book of Proverbs he uses that term. And we'll come back to that in just a second. But that's one of those neon lights that God shines in the book of Proverbs and says, hey, check this out. There's some good gold nuggets if you'll dig here. Watch this. My son, if thou will receive my words... And hide, and hide my commandments with thee, so thou incline thy ear unto wisdom, and apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searcheth for her as for hid treasures, then shall thou have understanding. The fear of the Lord, and, the, and find the uh, fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God for the Lord giveth wisdom out of his mouth and cometh knowledge and understanding so in these first six verses now remember God doesn't have a volume tone on his Bible you know I've always said if I wanted to get your attention I just get loud right that's how we all do it so but in for God to get your attention we've always said if God says something once it's important but if God repeats himself it must be really important here we are in six verses wisdom understanding knowledge understanding knowledge wisdom understanding knowledge well, he keeps repeating himself. Well, because he's letting you know what the three goals are, okay? And we're going to see that. Now, watch this. So, number one, the first goal of discipleship is knowledge. Now, if you are taking notes or you have a copy of your notes, this is where you fill in at this point. Knowledge. This is what I'm calling the facts, okay? We're simply taking the facts 
and instilling them or instructing them into another person. Now, understanding and wisdom will come later. We have to start with knowledge, okay? Now, let's watch this. This is exactly the goal for the simple one. Now, remember, the overall goal is to get him in down here to the land of wisdom. But if I'm the prudent man and my job is to disciple the simple man, then what is my goal here? My goal is to get him knowledge, get him facts. This is what you and I would talk about the 18 lessons in the Living Faith Fellowship, where we're going to take those 18 lessons and we're going to get those facts or that knowledge into that in individual. Okay, we're going to teach him about eternal security. We're going to teach him about the authority of the Word of God. We're going to teach him about baptism and the ordinances and your job and your employer and, and all that kind of deal. And what we're simply doing is we're not making geniuses here. Okay. We're not expecting these folks here to be go through 18 lessons and go, Oh, I got it. I'm done. Hey, thanks for the information. I'm moving on. No, no. Knowledge is step one. We got to get you the facts. Okay, you're never going to get into a land of wisdom. You're never going to learn to be wise in this world if you don't know anything. Okay, remember, not knowing anything is the, the characteristic of the simple. So we got to start with giving him the facts. Now watch. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. Now, remember chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, he says, this is why I wrote this, okay? Now, in verse 7, just two verses later, he says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instructions. Now, I want you to pay attention. First of all, the word fear here is not fear like I'm scared of God. It's a matter of reverence. Okay, And so one of the things that we're going to be doing in the 18 lessons when we teach somebody that is not only getting them the facts that we're going to start with a reverence towards God, a fear towards God. Okay, This kind of ties in to 2 Peter chapter 1 where he's talking about virtue and knowledge. Listen, guys, if you can't, virtue is to know to do what you should do. In other words, it's to know to do good that you've been taught. Okay, well, if I have no fear of the Lord, if I have no reverence to the Lord, then I'm not going to do those things anyway. Well, there's no reason to add knowledge to that. Okay, so in this case, the beginning of knowledge is reverence to the Lord. Now, hang with me. Then he goes on, he says, fools despise wisdom and instructions. Now, I want you to notice the word instructions is normally almost every time tied in with the word knowledge, okay? He goes on, he says, my son, there's that little neon light again, hear the instructions of thy father. So when I'm taking somebody through an 18 lesson course, the 18 lesson booklet, not only am I giving them facts, here's what the Bible says about eternal security, here's what the Bible says about the authority of the God, Word of God, here's what the Bible says about tithing. No, 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 no. What I'm also actually doing is not just giving them the facts, but I'm giving them an instruction. In other words, I'm taking those in facts and giving them practical application to those facts. So in other words, uh, Maybe just, you know, maybe when we're talking about maybe giving or dis, uh, tithing or something like that, maybe we're giving them the facts of the Word of God and what it says about that. However, in the same time, we're talking about budgets and we're talking about, you know, understanding not spending more than we make or, uh, or more than we earn and, and that kind of thing. And so instructions are always tied into that. Pay attention to that. Now watch this. Verse 8, uh, I mean, Proverbs 8, verse 10, receive my, here it is, instructions and not silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. They're always tied together. Okay. Proverbs 12, 1, whosoever loveth instructions loveth knowledge. Okay. But he that hateth reproof is brutish. Proverbs 22, bow down thy heart. Uh, down, excuse me, pow down thine ear and hear the words of thy wise and apply thy heart unto knowledge. Now, the reason I'm showing this is because point number two on your lesson today that we will get to in just a few minutes is going to be talking about where we're aiming and we're going to get to all that. 
However, if you look here, he says, when you're taking that simple one and you're getting them, number one, knowledge, number two, instructions, he says, I want you to apply it to a specific place. Okay. He says to the heart, imply that knowledge and instruction to the heart of an individual. Notice he doesn't say mind. We'll come back to that. Now, uh, Colossians 2, 2, we're now in the New Testament, right? Okay, so here in the New Testament, uh, Colossians 2 2, he says that their hearts might be comforted, not their minds, their hearts, being knitted together in love and onto all riches of the fullness of the assurance of understanding. There's a remember Proverbs 1, or excuse me, Proverbs 2, chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, understanding, wisdom, and knowledge. Well, what is Paul what is Paul gaining from right here? All Paul is doing is taking what he's learned in Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, and applying it in New Testament terms. And watch this. He says that their hearts might be comforted, being knitted together in love and onto all riches of the fullness of the assurance of understanding to the knowledgement of the mystery of God and the Father and of Christ in whom, watch this, are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Okay, so in chapter Two, verses 2 and 3, he says, listen, the goal here, knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. He goes on in verse 8. We're just talking six verse, or well, literally five verses later than when he just said, hey guys, their heart, it's their heart. What is it about their heart, Paul? Knowledge, wisdom, and instructions are in understanding. Watch this. Verse 8, in the same context, he says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy, vain deceit after the rudiments, or excuse me, after the traditions of men and after the rudiments of this world. And the rudiments basically mean the, uh, a worldview or a, uh, a practice of the world, the rudiments of how they go about things. Now watch this. So Paul tells you in verses 2 and 3, Guys, hit the heart. Aim at the heart. Hit the heart. What are we supposed to do with it, Paul? I want you to get them knowledge and understanding and wisdom. Because in verse 8, he says, if you don't do it, what's going to happen is somebody's going to come along and they're going to work through philosophy, through vain deceit, through traditions of men, after the rudiments of this world, and there goes your disciple. Okay, and here's what happens in most churches in America today is we get young kids that are raised in church by their parents and we don't fully understand how to disciple them. And so what we do is we just tell them to go to church. And so what we do is we get them to church, we get them involved in ministry, but we never really aim at their heart with knowledge, understanding and wisdom. And so what happens is they go off to college. What's the first thing any college does? Hook you up with philosophy. Okay? After that, vain deceit. The rudiments of this world. And so next thing you know, you got a guy who used to, you thought was solid, who has now went off the beaten path because of philosophy, rudiments of this world, vain deceit. Another way we lose disciples is because churches spend more time giving out the traditions of men or quote unquote traditions of churches than they do the Bible. In other words, we will disciple somebody in church traditions. We have a hard time discipling them in the word of God. And the reason being is because we, it, this traditions of men, first of all, most church people know the traditions of men or the traditions of churches better than they know the word of God. You know, bottom line is, we, we spend more time learning about the traditions and the teachings of man than we do the teachings of God. Now watch this. Okay, so Paul's laying this out in Colossians, and he's saying, listen, you and I, those of us that are born again that want to do the Lord's will, which is to make disciples, we're going to grab this simple guy as prudent men and wise men, and we're going to work within the realm of knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. And that's where we're going to lead him to, and we're going to aim it at his heart. However, 
If you are not successful, if you choose to do nothing but sit on your blessed assurance, then the scorner and the fool, are they're going to come around, aim at his heart, and they're going to work within philosophy, the traditions of men, and the rudiments of this world. Therefore, the reason why we lose this guy is because we did not lead him over here, and we allowed them to lead the other direction. Now... Okay, so 2 Timothy 3 7 says, ever learning, ever learning, getting the knowledge, getting the facts, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Guys, I, I've seen this over and over again where we, we have people who are trying to disciple, people who are trying to train in the Word of God, and man, they're. They're, they're diving in. They're just never really learning. They, they, you know, they may go through the 18 lessons. They may fill out all the paperwork, but they just don't get it at the end. They, they may know the, the answers to pass the test. They just don't get it. Now, so this is going to bring us into goal number two. So goal number one is we got to get you the facts, right? Okay. Goal number two is to get you understanding. Now, if getting knowledge is the facts, goal number one, then goal number two, understanding, is the ability to translate the facts to meaning. Okay? This is huge because people will go through the 18 lessons and learn a lot of things, but they don't ever, some don't ever, convert that over to meaning. Okay? Let me give you a prime example. When my wife and I were first married, we were dirt poor. We didn't we didn't do well with our with our finances. And so, if you'd have said, Corey, does the Bible teach about tithing? Oh, I could have took you to Malachi. I could have took you over to Second Corinthians chapter eight and nine, and uh, I could have showed you verses like reaping and sowing and and so on. I knew how to pass the test. I knew that's what the Bible taught. I knew the facts of disciple of of tithing. I knew the knowledge of tithing. What I hadn't figured out yet was how to convert that facts into meaning. Okay? And that's the whole idea, the ability to translate the facts into meaning. And that's exactly what that's about. That's what when you're growing in the Lord, you are now taking what you have learned and you've actually applied meaning to it. And so therefore, here we are 25, 26 years later uh, of being married. And now we understand tithing. Oh, we knew about it before and we knew the facts about tithing. Now we understand it. Now we have understanding of it. And that's one of the reasons why it's important that you not just get knowledge, you get understanding. Now, back to Proverbs 2, 1 and 6. My son, if thou wilt hear, receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom, apply thy heart... Remember that you're applying the what, not the mind, the heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge. So he's laying this back out again, right? Listen, the key to this is going from knowledge to understanding. Now let's, let's go through this. Now, if the simple one, his goal, goal number one, get knowledge. That's where goal number one is. The simple one. Which means goal number two is for the prudent man, and that is to take what he's learned over here and translate it into meaning. Now, I'm going to prove this in just a second. So goal number one is always working within the simple man. Goal number two is always working within the prudent man. Okay? Now, we'll get to wise in just a second, but watch this. Now, let's read some scripture. Now remember, the prudent man, when we take and break down his characteristics, he has all kinds of things, but one of them is he regards reproof. That's one of the characteristics about him, right? Okay. Well, if you go to Proverbs 19, 25, it says, smite a scorner. In other words, you backhand a scorner. I mean, wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great just as a church that, you know, you got a scorner, a guy that's creating problems, and you just... I mean, you lay him out, right? God says, smite a scorner, and the simple will be where? Now, you know, 
Bottom line is God even teaches us in the New Testament, when you church discipline somebody, you don't do it in private quarters, private meetings. You do that church wide. Why do you do that? So that the other church members would see it and understand and fear. Okay. The Bible goes on to talk about disciplining your children. When you discipline a child, you discipline them in front of the other kids. Why is that? Well, because the average kid has enough common sense to go, ooh, my brother just got laid out for that. I guess I better not do that. So God says, listen, smite the scorner. I, honestly, we can't backhand him, but the, the thought has crossed my mind. But notice, he says, the simple will beware. So the goal is not to get the scorner to act right. The goal is to get the simple to act right. Now, watch. Uh, Reprove one that hath understanding, and he will understand knowledge. Now remember, regard reproof. That's what a prudent man. The Bible says, reprove one that hath understanding, and he will understand knowledge. That's how we know we're working within the prudent man. Another, another characteristic, he gets knowledge, right? In other words, the simple one, that's where we're working. Goal number one is to get knowledge, get the facts to him. But once you become a prudent man, once you get understanding, you don't stop getting knowledge. You continue to grow in that knowledge so that you can continue to grow in your knowledge. Now, so the heart of him that hath understanding seeketh knowledge, but the mouth of fools feedeth on foolishness. The counsel in the heart of man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. See, that's, that's the whole reason he's the prudent man. He's the counselor here in this case. Now, the entrance of thy word giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. So the bottom line is, if we're ever going to be able to give understanding to the simple, Remember, our goal is to get him into the land of wisdom. But we don't take him from simple to wise. We take him from simple into understanding and then into wise. And God tells you in Psalms 19 how you're going to do that by the entrance of thy word. Guys, the discipleship is, is, is all about the word, okay? A lot of people go to coffee shops and hang out. They go to houses and have barbecues and they, they chill out with each other and they text and they do all this. That's great. I, and I'm glad you're spending time with people. But in all discipleship, you are careful to maintain the discipler, disciple E, the teacher and the student relationship. And at the end of the day, it's not discipleship is not about hanging out. Discipleship is about getting that book in inside of them so that that book can translate into understanding. Now, goal number three. So we have goal number one, which is you got to get the facts, right? Goal number two, understanding. What is that? That's the ability to translate facts into meaning. Goal number three, which is wisdom. Okay. So that is knowing what to do with the knowledge and understanding. Oh, by the way, if you're taking notes, this is where you fill in. Now notice what uh, we've got here. Facts. That's the knowledge, the ability to turn that facts into meaning that's understanding, but knowing what to do with the knowledge and understanding. In other words, knowing what to do with not only the knowledge you have, but the understanding that you have and actually put it into action. Okay. That is what wisdom is. Now, so remember our whole goal, Psalms 19, seven is to get the wise guy, excuse me, the wise guy. How about making wise the simple? Let's get the guy who's simple, gullible, un, uh, uh, void of understanding. Let's get him into the land of understanding so that we can get him into the land of wisdom. Now, so this is where we're working. Knowledge, the facts, that's this guy. Understanding and ability to translate it into meaning, that's the prudent man. Wisdom, that's knowing what to do with knowledge and understanding, that is reserved for the, the, the wise man. Those are your three goals out of the book of Proverbs. Our goal is to lead them step by step from simple into wise. Now, 
Proverbs 17, verse 24, wisdom is before him that hath understanding, but the eyes of the fools are in the ends of the earth. Now notice, that's how, I've had some people say, no, 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 it goes knowledge, wisdom, then understanding. I beg to differ, and here's why. Proverbs 17 clearly says, wisdom is before him. Who? You mean to tell me wisdom is available or before somebody? Yes, who is that somebody? He that hath understanding. So a prerequisite of wisdom is, pre, yes, pre I, I, I went blank there for a second. The prerequisite for wisdom is understanding according to that verse. Now, Proverbs 9 and 10, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Oh, wait a minute. I thought we read that at the, end, at the beginning that it said the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Well, it is. Now remember, fear is reverence. You start with reverence to the Lord to get knowledge. Well, you continue to have fear or reverence to the Lord to get wisdom. Same, same process, okay? He says, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Now, Proverbs 2.10, when wisdom entereth into thine heart, notice where it entered, Knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul. Okay? So, wise men, Proverbs 10, 14, wise men lay up knowledge, but the mouth of the foolish is near destruction. Okay? So, once you become a wise man, you don't go, hey, I've got it all figured out. I'm, I'm going to take a seat. No, no, no. A wise man continues to get knowledge. And if you remember, so does a prudent man. He continues to get knowledge. This thing of knowledge doesn't end. We continue to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, no matter what stage, what whether it's simple, prudent, or wise. Now, Proverbs 21, 11, when the scorner is punished, there we go backhanding him again, the simple is made wise. Ooh, woo. So we can gain wisdom by watching somebody else's failures. And that's what God just said here. He says, one of the ways that a simple one becomes into the land of wisdom is to watch the scorner get punished. Right? When the wise is instructed, he receiveth knowledge. That's how you know he's a wise man. He continues to receive instruction. And remember, instruction and knowledge are tied together. So then we get in here into the New Testament, and Paul picks up on this thought. And he says, this is 1 Corinthians 2, 1 and 8. And he says, I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, okay? But in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. How bet we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, Yet not the wisdom of this world. Now the word perfect, obviously, you know by now is mature. He says that wisdom is not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world on to glory. Now, here's the key. The reason I'm showing you this is Paul's making a contrast. He says, when I came to preach, I, it, it wasn't with enticing words. It wasn't big vocabularies like Brett Bartlett. It was just basic speech. Now, now, at the end of the day, he says, listen, wisdom that w we brought was not the wisdom of man's wisdom or wisdom of this world. We brought to you a hidden wisdom, God's wisdom. Okay, and the word hidden in the Bible doesn't, doesn't, he even goes on, he talks about a mystery of God. Uh, here he says, the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom. Now the word wisdom, or excuse me, mystery in the word of God is not mystery like nobody can figure it out. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a game of clue. It's not a, ooh, Scooby-Doo, ooh, figure out the mystery. No, a mystery simply means it was once hidden hidden 
that has now been revealed, okay? And so what, the reason I'm bringing all that out is, once again, we're doing a contrast. As before, we said they work in philosophy and rudiments of this world and vain deceit on this side. And we work over in knowledge and instructions and in wisdom. Okay, on their side, they work in wisdom of men and wisdom of this world. But on our side, we're not working with the wisdom of this world. We're not working with the wisdom uh, of, of men. We're working with the wisdom of God, the hidden wisdom. So therefore, if this guy is going to get in the land of, of wise, it's not going to be because of the wisdom of men. It's not going to be because you and I are smart, I can assure you. It's going to be because we're working in God's wisdom, that hidden wisdom that is clearly laid out in Scripture. Now, that's, uh, that's point number one, our three goals. Our goal is to get our disciple, our simple one, first we got to get him the facts, the knowledge. Then we got to get him understanding the ability to translate that those facts into meaning then we got to get him into the land of wisdom where we can now take the facts and the understanding and know what to do with them in other words put them into action okay but now we're going to close out with this second part uh, on your notes and this is the biblical aim for discipleship so we know what the goal is Okay, the goal is those three things, but now we're going to talk about where do we aim when we are trying to hit those three goals. If we have three bullseyes to hit, we got to know where we're aiming. Okay, now watch this. We go back over here, and, I, and I'm showing you this just so you don't think I'm randomly pulling stuff out of Proverbs that, no, it is systematically put together for discipleship. Now, remember, over here in Proverbs 2, 1, he says, my son. Remember, we've said, I think it's 23 times that God uses that term in the scripture. And every time he does in the book of Proverbs, and when he does, pay attention. God is speaking. Now, watch this. My son, if thou will receive my words, if thou will hide my commandments with me, so that thou incline thy ear. Okay, that's where he started, right? So then we get into chapter 4, and we see this term used again, right? He says, my son, attend to my words. I think I just read that. Okay, he says, incline thine ear unto my sayings. I think we just read that. Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through and 6. He said, let them, my words, not depart from mine eyes. Then he says, keep them, what's the them? The words, in the midst of thine heart. Okay, I'm going to come back to that. For they, what are they? The words of God are life unto those that find them, and heal, or excuse me, and health to all their, their flesh. Verse 23, keep thine heart. Okay, now watch this. The word keep here is he's saying keep it, like hang on to it, right? The word keep here means to guard, like to protect. He says, keep thine heart with all diligence for out of it, what's the it, the heart, are the issues of life. Okay, so our aim to biblical discipleship is not the mind, it's the heart. And you say, why is that? Because that's where the issues of life are. Okay, you ever met somebody, it's probably me, but if you've ever met somebody and you go, good night, that guy's got issues, right? Well, those issues didn't come from his brain. They came from his heart, right? And God's saying, listen, the issues are the problems in people's lives come out of their heart. So when you're discipling, when you're training somebody, I need you focused in on their heart. And the purpose of discipleship, when biblical discipleship is done right in a church, the issues of life are dealt with not from a church pulpit standpoint. They're dealt with from the disciple, disciple E standpoint. All those issues, that's what you're talking about at the coffee shop. And what we're dealing with is, hey, guys, I, I know that's what's going on in your life. Let's open up the Word of God and see what God has to say about those issues. Now, watch this. The word heart is mentioned 81 times in the book of Proverbs. Let that sink in. 
There's only 31 chapters. 81 times God mentions the word heart. Okay? The mind only is mentioned twice. Now think about that. Your heart mentioned 81 times. Your mind mentioned twice. Now catch this. And both times in reference to a fool or a wicked man. And here's what goes on in discipleship is we have a tendency to aim for the head or the mind and not the heart. Uh, when I look back at my failures in discipleship, and many, many people have failed in discipleship at our church with me being their discipler. Some of it is just their pure, they didn't want to do it, they didn't want to commit, I get all that. But there is still a lot of guys that have failed in our church when it comes to discipleship that I am to blame, and here's the reason being. Uh, a lot of that cool stuff that we like to study, the Genesis 6, the Ezekiel 28s, the uh, Ezekiel you know, 38 and 39, Russia, or Gog, Magog, is that Russia? What is all that? You know, Revelation, uh, what is, who, who, who's the whore of Revelation 17? And all that good stuff, we go in and we dive in, we study that stuff out, and all that's great, right? But the problem is when we're pumping people full of knowledge here and not here, that's where we end up with the issues of life, okay? And so most of my failures have been because I'm studying out something. I want to show my disciple guy, you know, my disciple E, hey, man, check this stuff out that I've been studying. And he's not ready for it. I should have been concealing knowledge. That's what a good prudent man does, if you will remember the characteristics. God says, listen, the aim is not the mind. The aim is the heart. Now, so if I, if I know that the heart is where I'm aiming, then I've got to start with understanding that the heart that I'm aiming at is tainted. It's messed up, and that's letter A, the heart is tainted. And if you're taking notes, this is where you fill in. Now, Jeremiah 17, 9, and I, I know this isn't the Proverbs, but I, I do want to set a precedent. All right? The heart is deceitful above all things, and is desperately wicked who can know it guys i hear people all the time i you know you hear a preacher comes and he hey i'm just here today to give you what's on my heart well don't do that i, I don't want to uh, your heart is deceitful desperately wicked man uh, don't give us what's on your heart give us what's in the book right okay and he he says it's desperately wicked it's deceitful it'll fool you okay so I got to know going into this that what I am dealing with is dealing with a defective product. And a lot of our discipleship breaks down because one, we're aiming at the head or two, we're aiming at a heart and not realizing that the heart we're dealing with is defective. Now, Proverbs 28, verse 26, he that trusteth, trusteth in his own heart is a fool. Uh, once again, you have people in the church and they'll say, they'll stand up, testify, or somebody say, if I know my heart, well, you don't. It's desperately wicked. Sit down. You don't know it. All right? Now watch. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool, but whosoever walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. Proverbs 12, verse 20 Deceit is in the heart of them that imagine evil, but the counselors of peace is joy. The heart is deceitful. Proverbs 19, verse 3. The foolishness of a man perverteth his way, and his heart fretteth against the Lord. We're dealing with tainted product. Now, uh, hang on one second. Let me read this and I'll bring you up to speed on something else. Happy is the man that feareth the way, but he that hardeneth his heart shall fall into mischief. We're dealing with a heart issue, guys. Okay. Now I realize and I, I recognize as New Testament Bible be believers that we now, through the new birth, through being born again and being regenerated, we now deal with a new man and not the old man. However, I also recognize that there is an old man present and there is a new man present. And we choose to walk in the new man and not the old man. We choose to walk clothed in him, not the old man. 
However, so when we talk about a heart that is tainted, as Bible-believing New Testament Christians, we should be able to work with a pure heart. We should be able to work knowing that the tainted heart we had, that stony heart that we once had, God gave us a new heart when we got saved. However, we have a tendency to walk in the old way, the old path. We have a tendency to walk in the old man and not the new man walk in the spirit okay now so not only is the heart tainted but number letter b and if you're taking notes this is where you fill in the heart is our target okay it's important now watch this so let's go back to proverbs 4 21 let not de let them let them not depart from thine eyes keep them in the midst of thy heart he's talking about the words of god right Notice he says, he doesn't say keep them in thy mind, keep them in the soul, no, keep them in the heart. Keep them in the heart of a man, and I, I recognize we're talking about the soul and the spirit of man. Now, notice here, he says, keep them in the midst of thy heart. Now, when wisdom entereth into thine heart, knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul. Proverbs 3, 1, my son, there it is again, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. Not let thy mind, let thine heart, okay? Whoa, we got to miss a page. There we go. Proverbs 4.4. 4, he taught me also and saith unto me, let thine heart retain my words. Keep my commandments and live. Where? What's going to keep my words? Thine heart. The biggest problem in the breakdown of discipleship is we get a lot of Bible up here. We get very few Bible in here. Okay, that is the difference between success and failure in discipleship. Proverbs, excuse me, Proverbs 23, 7. For as he thinketh, where? In his heart, so is he, eat and drink. Now we know that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Well, the bottom line is it's not how he thinketh in his mind, how does he think in his heart? All right, moving along. My son, Proverbs 7, 1, my son, keep my words. There it is. One of those neon signs. Boy, if you got time, trace that. My son, keep my words. Lay up my commandments with thee. Where? Keep my commandments. Where? And live. And my law as the apple of thine eye. Bind them upon thy fingers. Write them upon the table of thine heart. Okay? Proverbs 23, 26, my son, there it is again, neon sign, give, my, give me thine heart and let thy eyes observe my ways. Listen, you give me an individual's heart and I can lead them into the land of wisdom. You give me their mind, they're going to end up in the same place as a fool, working with man's wisdom. All right, now... Last of all, and we're going to close out right here, and if you're taking notes, this is where you pick up. The heart is tenuous, okay? Now, that's just a big fancy word to go along my alliteration that literally means it's weak. The heart is weak. Now, let's go back to our context verse. Proverbs 4, 20 through 23. Now remember, he says, you keep them in the midst of thy heart, verse 21. Verse 23, keep thine heart with all diligence. And we said that means to protect it. Why? Because out of it becomes the issues of life. So we're keeping the heart with all diligence. Okay? Now, we're going to protect it. Why? It's weak. Look at Proverbs 6, 23 and 24. Five, for the commandment is a lamp and the law is a light and reproof of the instructions are the way of life to keep thee from the evil woman from the flattery of the tongue of the strange woman lust not after her beauty where in thine heart where does lust come from thy heart now I do recognize that when we look at any scripture, there is one interpretation. God says there is no private interpretation. There's one interpretation of scripture, and that is God's interpretation. However, there are three basic applications, and most of you know this. The one is historical. This, the verses 
23 through 25 of Proverbs 6 historically were written by Solomon. We also know that each one of these verses not only have a historical application, but they have what's known as a devotional or inspirational application. And that's is how do we apply this to our daily life? Well, we could literally go into these verses and say, guys, lust comes out of your heart. Careful around these strange women. Careful around uh, the, 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 the evil woman. Man, stay away from those types, okay? But we also know that each verse of Scripture not only has historical, inspirational, but it also has what's known as doctrinal or prophetical application. And we can go in here and we can look at this strange woman, this evil woman, and apply that to, to religion, and listen, guys, you're looking at a guy, I can't stand religion, I hate religion, there is nothing good out of religion. Uh, what people need to do is junk religion and get a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, so the bottom line is this strange woman, she comes along with flatteries and, and all that, and with her eyes, she, she allures you out, and God says, hey, be careful with that, she's aiming at your heart. Isn't it interesting the scorner and the fool on the other end know what to aim at. We have a tendency no we have a tendency not to know what to aim at. Now, Psalms 19:11, thy word have I hid in thine heart that I might not sin against thee. Where are we going to hide that word? In our heart. Why? Because that's what allows us to overcome that. Now, because it's not our brain, there are people that can stand up and quote more scripture than I ever could. It's in their brain, but they can't get it into their heart. Uh, I'll give you a quick story. I used to know a guy and worked with him. The guy's name was Frank. Frank had a Frank called himself a reverend. He was a he was a minister, and Frank would be in and out of jail. When Frank would go to jail, in order to protect himself from the other inmates. He would get very religious and talk to them about how he was a preacher and a, rev a reverend and all this other stuff. And to back it up, Frank could quote scripture. Frank could quote a lot more scripture than I could. But when Frank would get out of jail, Frank would end up in some situation uh, breaking the law, ending up backing jail. Now, what was the difference? I was a young preacher. Frank was an older guy at the time. He's probably another 20, 30 years older than me when we were working together. And what was the difference? I was getting the Word of God in my heart. I couldn't quote as many scriptures as he could, but he was getting the Word of God in his head. And because of that, his life had issues because he did not protect his heart with the word. Now, James 4, 6 through 8 says, But he that giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. No, right? Not just cleaning the hands. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. He didn't say purify your mind. Purify your heart. Okay? Now, that's basically it as far as these first two, or first two sessions. Now, obviously, you can take this further and further throughout the book of Proverbs. And we have at our church uh, done that. And it took us weeks to go through it. However, this will get you on the road to understanding what true biblical discipleship is through the book of Proverbs. And so we have a goal. Our goal is to get them knowledge. we got to get those simple ones into the land of wisdom. And we got to get them knowledge, the facts, and then we got to lead them into the land of prudence or being a prudent man. And so that we can get them not only the facts, but having understanding of those facts and then leading them into the third goal, which is the land of wisdom. But once again, if we don't aim this right at the heart and we aim it at the head, then it's all going to be null and void because we're aiming at the wrong spot. So I hope you've received a blessing. If there's any way I can help you in the future, or if you have any questions about this lesson, feel free to contact me. You can get my name and number from James uh, DeCoker. And so God bless you. I hope you received a blessing. And hopefully next year at the Discipleship Conference, we will all be able to gather in person. So God bless you.